Good afternoon, everybody. We are in the home stretch here at the Water Pavilion. Um, it's been a, a very long afternoon, uh, but a very, very productive one, and I could not be prouder to be hosting you today. My name is Kate Lamb. I am the Global Director of Water Security at CDP, and I will be your host for the final hour of the session here at the Water Pavilion at COP26. Welcome to those of you joining us online and to those of you that are here in 3D in real life. It's very exciting to see you all. Um, we have three fabulous sessions this afternoon, um, and they're fairly rapid. They're 20 minutes each, so you're going to be getting bombarded with a fair amount of information, so please do bear with us. Um, the first is the, to announce the launch of the Water Stewardship Acceleration Forum. This is a very exciting initiative um, that will be spearheaded and, and uh, under the Secretariat leadership of, of the Alliance of Water Stewardship, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Adrian Sim, who is the CEO of that Alliance for Water stewardship. So over to you, Adrian. Uh, thank you very much, Kate, for the introduction and our thanks also to the COP organisers and the sponsors of the Water Pavilion for making this happen. Uh, as Kate said, my name is Adrian Sim. I'm Chief Executive of, of AWS, the Alliance for Water Stewardship. And I'm talking to you from the sunny east coast of Scotland and I hope uh, you're getting some of our nice weather over there in Glasgow. Um, AWS is actually one of three organizations that's, which is co-convening this session uh, and also co-convening the uh, foundation phase of the Water Stewardship Acceleration Forum. Uh, my job today is to explain what the WASA Forum, let's just call it the, the abbreviated term, the WASA Forum is, why it's needed, what it will do and, and why we want your help in, in making it work. Before we get to that, let me just briefly touch on the definition of water stewardship, which you can see on your screens at the moment. This definition is the one that has been developed by the organization that I have the privilege of leading AWS, but is generally recognized as, a, as the, the, the benchmark definition for water stewardship globally. It emphasizes both uh, what water stewardship should achieve in terms of social, cultural, economic, and environmental benefits. But it also, and importantly, emphasizes how those benefits are, are delivered. Uh, water stewardship is fundamentally an inclusive, transparent, and stakeholder-driven process. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, there have been several organizations, um, not seeing the slide, but I'll continue speaking, there are several organizations involved in advancing water stewardship. Um, the next slide, uh, if we can see that one, um, uses statistics from four of those organizations to give you a snapshot of the progress that has been made over the last uh, decade or so. Um, hopefully this slide will be visible soon. I'm not seeing it on my screen. Um, other key actors in this space include the 2030 Water Resources Group, that's hosted by the World Bank, AGWA, that's the uh, Alliance for Global Water Adaptation, uh, who need to be acknowledged for their efforts in, in getting water onto the agenda at this COP and getting the water pavilion established. Uh, the Nature Conservancy, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and WWF, that's the Worldwide Fund for Nature. Collectively and individually, we have been working to help water users to take credible action on shared water challenges. And as the headline stats, which unfortunately seem to be some uh, difficulty in, in, uh, in uh, showing, um, there they are. Um, the headline stats indicate over that 10 year period, we have made significant progress, uh, but we all recognize that more progress is needed and faster progress is needed. As a community, we want water stewardship to achieve more. We believe that this is possible, and this is why we have developed the, the, the WASA Forum to help accelerate the scale of water stewardship uptake. Uh, the next slide, please. Over the last decade, uh, we have learned a lot. Uh, we have learned a lot uh, in terms of what works. We have developed uh, a lot of varied amount of scalable and implementable solutions to help 
companies and major water users uh, adopt water stewardship. Um, we have um, engagement from global business, from international NGOs, from development agencies. We have local networks of, of smaller companies serving global supply chains, civil society actors who are impacted by global, globalized sourcing, water managers who see the value that water stewardship can bring to their work, academics and researchers who support our objectives in driving collective action. As we speak, there are many active on the ground collaborations happening right now in many parts of the world. Most of the pieces of the water stewardship puzzle are in place, but the challenges is, is so enormous and the opportunities are so enormous, especially in the context of climate change and the, and the opportunity for water stewardship to really support climate action that we need to go beyond our existing networks and bring in what we are terming here the enabling agents. These are the those from the government and the financial sector who essentially control the levers of policy and finance and who can help to take water stewardship to scale. Um, the next slide, please. Um, and this is why we are um focusing our initial efforts on the two objectives that you see on the on the screen now um the first is to strengthen the vis visibility of water stewardship on political agendas at present there is only limited uh, government um, recognition of the value of water stewardship governments are key actors in, in, in enabling change to happen making things happen and we believe that wasa forum can be a mechanism for the governments to understand how water stewardship can contribute and support policy priorities the second objective is uh, around building a platform for policy and financial dialogues it is to help leverage the political interest that we have achieved in the first objective and really turn that into into actual action at scale and the next slide please now this is not just an announcement of a predetermined initiative it's a call to get involved to help shape the wasa forum to make it real and this slide illustrates how we see this working AWS, the CEO, Water Mandate, and GIZ, we are collectively convening and resourcing the formation of the WASA Forum. We are serving collectively as the Secretariat, again, in the formation phase, to help provide the fuel to get the WASA Forum um, off the ground. We're inviting our peer organizations to uh, help join this effort as part of an advisory group to help us shape the, the actions, shape the strategies, tap into the networks to, uh, to uh, really bring this um, forum to life. The focus of the forum then will turn to two types of events. One is a working level event. Um, these are aimed at practitioners to really start shaping a coherent uh, ask for the uh, policy and financial sector actors. And the second is a, are the, the high level events. These are going to be really seeking to drive commitments from those uh, who, as I said before, the enabling agents who hold the levers of policy and finance. The first of those high level events we expect to take place at the uh, World Water Forum next year in Dakar with the second uh, scheduled for the uh, UN Conference on Water Action decade in New York the following year, 2023. So with that, I would like to hand over to uh, Andrea Eriksson from the Nature Conservancy, TNC, to give us a, a, a more uh, case-based uh, illustration of why this work is so important. Over to you, please, Andrea. Great, thank you, Adrian. Um... So next slide then, please, uh, for the purpose of taking a look at what this might look like in a sort of project context, I wanted to talk about the experience that we've seen in, um, in Colombia. And it's been a great day for news from Colombia. 
um, hearing some great announcements there at the COP where I hope to join you soon. Um, but this is a, a, a pace, uh, place-based experience uh, working on water funds in Colombia where partners with the Latin America Water Funds Partnership, IDB and FEMSA Foundation, the Nature Conservancy and with IKI, we've worked for many years to support seven communities in establishing water funds. In, in, in themselves, water funds are collective action mechanisms where, where private sector is also an important leading partner and often is the catalytic driver to get things going on the ground. But in the case of these seven water funds around Colombia, what they found is oftentimes the limiting factor might be, in fact, uh, bringing public sector financing on board. And so uh, the different water funds said, you know, to take this to the next level, we should work together and form an alliance, the Water for Colombia Alliance, to think about how to take water stewardship to scale and address the barriers. And you'll notice here from the partners, there's a long list of partners, public and private, but the private industry really, again, was at the leading edge of that, or the associations of the major industries of Colombia. They together uh, talked about what were the barriers to scaling water stewardship in Colombia and came up with a platform, a framework of work, and thought about what was their real catalytic potential that they had there. And we'll go to the next slide, please. Um, the the opportunity that they saw that they had right in front of them was to look at some policy changes that would accelerate the investment from the public sector. And so in specific terms, they worked with the National Regulatory Agency to discover how they might incentivize investment in watersheds from the water supply sector. And how might they clarify further the roles of watershed management and um, you know, sort of put in place the kind of long-term funding mechanism that brings funding uh, more more funding to bear than what the private sector could do alone. And um, so, with that, you find that there's a decision space that belongs to the public sector. Um, but that decision space was informed by this alliance in the private sector and was also supported by the sort of space of dialogue to know that the public sector was supporting this policy dialogue, bringing in the political space uh, so that people understood that this was a sort of broad-based uh, uh, idea that was worthy of support. And then lastly, what were the tools for implementation? How might we put together a package of materials that could be supportive to the Water uh, Commission to actually get these things done? So this is just one example, sort of putting it in context, in place, of how the private sector might be able to incentivize, promote, and assist in seeing policy changes then allows to scale water stewardship in a certain geography like is Colombia. So I think the real promise with something like WASA is how to take these experiences and do them many times over. And they will be in different scales, uh, municipal levels, state levels, national levels. But this overall uh, WASA experience that we hope will uh, carry us forward will look at how we do replicate these kinds of private-public uh, partnerships that assist in policy change. So I'm going to leave it there. And I'm going to uh, invite Ingrid Timbo, from, who's the policy director from AWA, uh, the Alliance for Global Water um, Adaptation, and uh, Ingrid, just some reflections for today. Over to you. My microphone? Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much. As, uh, as Andrea mentioned, my name is Ingrid Timbo, Policy Director at the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation. Um, and I just first want to uh, congratulate the partners um, in the WASAF initiative um, for the really exciting um, work that they're doing and really critical work um, that they're doing. So we know that um, the global economy must rapidly decarbonize um, while also managing increasingly variable water resources. And that's a major challenge. At the same time, we're woefully, woefully behind um, on the delivery of universal access to water sanitation and hygiene. And so these are issues that cannot be solved just by the private sector alone um, or, or by the public sector. Um, and so I think this is an area um, where collaboration is really needed, and it's also an area um, where, where there tends to be um, a pretty large disconnect 
Um, and so playing that kind of facilitation role as the example that was mentioned um, in Colombia really uh, showcases um, kind of facilitating connections between uh, these two different groups, I think, um, is really, really important. So I think that's definitely one of the most critical services that the WASF uh, forum can, can provide, um, is helping to reduce this fragmentation. But of course, the dialogue then, of course, needs to go both ways. So it's not just, um, you know, what can the public sector bring, but it's also, you know, public policies are unlikely to change, we know, unless there is demand um, for those changes. And those have to come um, from the private industry um, as well as civil society. So um, I think that's another potential benefit of the forum is that companies already engaged in water stewardship activities um, can really raise the profile of water within the climate change uh, policy agenda. So kind of both ways, facilitation, I think, um, is a major thing for this forum. And so um, really encouraged to see what's happening in Colombia um, and really encouraged to see um, what's happening elsewhere. And hopefully it's accelerated over the next few years. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ingrid. Uh, very well said, and, and I think um, very important to emphasise that that water stewardship is a is a a, a multi way exercise. None of us have all the answers. Uh, context matters a lot, and um, making sure that that we provide safe spaces for the kind of conversations that need to happen is really critical. Um, so I would just like to to close uh, with a couple of comments. Uh, the first is to draw your attention to our proposed timeline of activities, which you can you can see on the screen now. Uh, we've mapped out our activities from our our soft launch in Stockholm earlier this year um, to now at COP26 and and through to the formation of the advisory group uh, and working group meetings and then the high level event in Dakar scheduled next year. Uh, the second comment is, is kind of implicit within the timeline that you see here, and that is that this is a collaborative effort. Um, as I've, I've stressed several times already, uh, AWS, the CEO of Water Mandate, GIZ, we are convening this uh, um, uh, initiative at the beginning. But we need your support to make WASA really take off and, and, and fulfill its potential and plug those gaps that I think we all agree exist. And so please engage with us uh, as soon as you can and as robustly as you can. Um, if anything you've, you've heard today is of interest or if some of it doesn't make sense, just get in touch with either ourselves at AWS with the CO water mandate or with um, GIZ uh, and let's start that dialogue. I believe on the um, on the next final slide, uh, we may have also the website address, which will be live. In fact, I believe it already is live. So with that, thanks very much for your time, for the opportunity, and all the very best. Uh, we're all wishing you well for the rest of COP26. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian, and thank you to all of our presenters in that, that quick fire round about WASA. Um, for those of you that are perhaps wondering what we're focused on here for this last hour, we're talking about how to accelerate private sector investment in water-related solutions. So we talked a moment ago about financial institutions and how in the private um, uh, mainstream financial institutions and how we can accelerate their investment and their action on the global water crisis and uh, ultimately enhancing climate resilience. This session is focused on those large, uh, large private organizations themselves and what we can do to ensure that they're making the right strategic investments in the right place at the right time. So it gives me really great pleasure to move into our second segment, another 20 minute quick fire round. Um, this is being hosted by Boom Sik Yu, who is the senior regional advisor with the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands. Um, and it marks the launch of an e-learning course to enhance water stewardship for climate change adaptation and mitigation. Um, I would really would like to welcome uh, Mr. Yu up to the stage so that he can start to talk to you about the initiative this afternoon. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. Let me it took me a long time to get, get out of the body. 
worth waiting for. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, and I'd like to thank my partners, Danone and WWF, for this uh, launching of the online course on sustainable uh, freshwater ecosystems. Uh, friends and colleagues, healthy wealth wetlands are critical to addressing the tri tri triple planetary crisis of climate change, biodiversity loss, and freshwater scarcity. We will not achieve the Paris Agreement goals without the protecting and restoring wetlands. Wetlands are proven, powerful, nature-based solutions to mitigate carbon emissions. They are essential to achieving net zero by mid-century. Peatlands cover 3% of the planet's land surface, but store 30% of land-based carbon. This is twice as much as all of all world's forests combined. They also sequester and store carbon 55 times faster than tropical forests. Loss of wetlands exacerbates climate change and also reduces our capacity to mitigate and adapt to climate impact. An estimated 35% of the world's wetland areas are lost between 1970 and 2015, three times the rate of forest loss. Loss of wetlands ecosystem leads to loss of ecosystem services, including carbon sinks, and releases massive amount of carbons to the atmosphere. Around 50 million hectares of peatlands are currently drained globally, and this is responsible for approximately 4% of all anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. At least half of lost peatlands must be restored by 2030 to enable global warming to remain below 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius. Wetlands are also critical to adaptation efforts and building resilience to climate impacts. Blue carbon ecosystems such as mangroves, seagrasses, and coral reefs reduce wave power, shielding coastal communities from tsunamis, storms, and floods. And the coastal communities, they are 60% of the world's population. Coral reefs provide protection up to 34,000 US dollars per hectare every year. Inland ecosystems such as floodplains, rivers, and lakes absorb and store excess rainfall, reducing floods and providing water dry, during dry seasons. Water demand is expected to grow by 50% by 2030, with freshwater resources depleting rapidly through pollution, climate change, and freshwater uh, wetland loss. These nature-based solutions are often far cheaper than hard infrastructures. Some, with mangrove restoration projects costing up to two to six times less than submerged breakwaters. But they also provide critical additional benefits to tackle water scarcity, biodiversity loss, and environmental degradation. The loss of wetlands has a direct correlation with increasing freshwater scarcity, loss of biodiversity, and making wetland preservation and restoration a win-win win -win for addressing the triple crisis that we all face. All of society must act to reverse the loss of wetlands and accelerate and upscale investment in their conservation and restorations. Conservation investment needs to our needs are estimated at 3.9 trillion US dollars. Funding from governments and philanthropic organizations alone will not be enough to solve the current crisis. All of society, which includes actors from the public sector, the private sector, which includes civil society, indigenous communities, must combine efforts and resources in order to accelerate actions, obtain the level of finance essential to reach the scale that will reverse the current trajectory where the wetlands are the most degraded ecosystem. Countries, by including wetlands within their nationally determined contributions, for example, have an opportunity to reduce the emissions and restore this ecosystem for multiple benefits. The recent report shows that this is, there's a massive opportunity here, as only 21% of parties of the UNFCCC have so far referred to wetlands specifically prior, as a priority area within their NDCs. Friends and colleagues, Capacity building and knowledge sharing 
are critical to raising awareness, galvanizing public-private action for wetlands conservation and restoration. Capacity building under the Convention on the Wetlands is recognized as an important instrument with a vital role for enhancing awareness, facilitating participation, all critical to the conservation of the world's wetlands. This online course, developed in collaboration with Danone and WWF, builds on a long-term partnership aimed at conserving wetlands. It has, it's been developed to bridge the knowledge and capacity gap between the private and public sector in the hopes that it will accelerate joint actions to facilitate sustainable use, management of wetlands, and watersheds. The contracting parties of the Ramsar Convention recognizes that private sector has an important role for the conservation of wetlands, especially as primary users and beneficiaries of the ecosystem. However, a latest report revealed a general decline in the extent of activities undertaken by the private sector for the conservation in the Ramsar sites and wetlands in general. We need unprecedented cross-sectoral collaboration to scale wetlands actions towards climate and other SDG goals. This e-learning course being launched today is therefore timely and responds to a real need that facilitate public and private sector engagement for wetlands, showing critical roles wetlands play in climate change mitigation, adaptation, and vital benefits towards biodiversity and water scarcity. Opportunities for private and public sector to integrate wetland conservation within national or corporate climate, environmental, broader planning and policy. And finally, urgency to spur broad, inclusive collaboration across all society to protect, conserve, and restore wetlands. Thank you very much. Uh, th th thank you. This is my opening speech. Uh, next, I would like to give to Kieran, who has been the real the power, the brain behind this project. Kieran? Brilliant. Thank you so much for the introduction. All right, I can't be there, but I'm um, really excited to be part of this. Um, I think in, in lieu of time, let's skip forward um, a few slides to the fifth slide, if that's possible. Brilliant. And keep going to the fifth slide. Um, so I think much of what was discussed, I can go into a bit more detail, but I think the important thing is that finance gap. Um, and it's really sort of showing that no matter which SDG we look at, we're really only meeting about a third of the finance that is really needed to go and deliver those SDGs. If we're really focusing on conservation, it is 300 to 400 billion uh, US dollars per year that we need uh, to go and conserve and restore ecosystems. And we're currently only getting around 15% of that. If we go to the next slide, we can go and see that uh, philanthropy and global ODA um, has really been focusing and um, deploying uh, the much needed capital towards these SDGs and um, trying to figure out how to go and close that gap of two thirds. We're not going to get that just from philanthropy and global ODA. We really need to start looking for other sources of finance and sources of funding to really support the SDGs and deliver on the SDGs. If we look at the private finance pools that we see on the screen right now, we can really see that this really dwarfs the supply um, of the philanthropy and ODA. And this, um, these fin funding financing streams and flows, it's really important for us to understand them, to access them and start influencing them and start working with the private sector and private finance to start closing that SDG gap. All of this was really showing that the private sector is a very crucial group um, and this is, a group, this is a group that's also increasingly looking for ways to invest in conversation, and conservation and also biodiversity and really looking at really important and interesting projects that they can bring to start helping us safeguard our landscapes. So really understanding how to close this financial gap is important, um, but importantly working with the private sector and bringing these private sector players and impact groups together in these landscapes and basins is crucial. Next slide, please. And it was just in mind that uh, Danon, the Secretariat of Ramsar Convention on Wetlands, um, and WWF came together to go and create this package of knowledge and training uh, to really go and start building that foundational knowledge of key concepts to really enhance that public and private uh, sector engagement. We really hope that it's tools like this one and many others out there that we can really start to work more closely with the private sector to go and deliver benefits to the world's freshwater ecosystems 
And also it's important for us to go and provide this content in a way that can be accessible online, accessed for free and also available from anywhere. And so this is a program that is self-paced and um, completely online. Uh, next slide, please. We designed this program to really go and start building and promoting a greater understanding of the value of freshwater ecosystems and importantly, how they contribute to the economic, social, and environmental development goal. We really want to increase the awareness of all the different stakeholders in these different landscapes and basins, and importantly, how they interact, support, and impact each other. And lastly, we want to showcase how we can start to really create opportunities and develop projects that can unlock further financing for freshwater conservation. These include subjects like wise use in the landscape approach, payments for ecosystem services, bankable projects, and water funds. Next slide, please. We've split the program into three different courses, and each of them will include around five to 10 minute lectures, videos, case studies, additional information, and, um, and links to really important and really crucial other resources to really go and reinforce the subject that we're discussing. In the first course, we introduce freshwater ecosystems and the value that they provide, including discussing the barriers and opportunities uh, for these freshwater ecosystems, in order to really go and build and support protection and restoration of them. During this learning journey, we're, it's also very important to go and look at the practical examples of these topics. And there are really many great examples out there that cover these topics that can really go and show the learner how these things actually get developed and implemented in real life, then also hopefully to go and inspire them to go and do similar kind of approaches um, in their own landscapes. And so we really start to go and link these core topics and subjects to actual implemented cases. The second uh, course goes and covers the various approaches to safeguard wetlands. And during this course, we'll provide the learner with information how to effectively conserve and manage wetlands, and then to discuss the five approaches that really enable effective wetland conservation. Next slide, please. And then moving on to the next and final course, this one will be focusing on working with the private sector. We will cover engaging um, in the private sector by building the enabling environments, and how to go and strengthen and facilitate the public-private sector engagement. We review voluntary market-based mechanisms and see them as a really important tool to go and support conservation and wise use. And we also show how they can be applied and developed in our landscapes and basins. It's really the link to external tools that are really important here because there's a lot of great work out there that goes and um, summarizes and details these voluntary market-based mechanisms. And we really want to make sure that we can go and really add new content to this um, to the world um, and sort of really go and link and combine um, these amazing resources that already exist. And then the last two topics, we'll go and bring all of this previous content together to really start developing projects with the private sector. These will help teams identify bankable or investable opportunities and start to unlock new and much needed finance for conservation projects. Um, that can really go and start developing and supporting all of our stakeholders in our landscapes. Next slide, please. And then lastly, we've developed and tested this platform um, leading up to today, and we're very proud to launch it here externally at COP26. Following this session, we will provide more in-depth webinars and workshops to share and build on this learning program, and hopefully in the future to have more face-to-face -face workshops that we can then go to the next level and the next step beyond this foundational content. The first of these webinars is taking place on the 25th of November. Um, and if you need any information, please chat to Danon Ramso or ourselves at WWF. We really hope this can be another tool and resource to go and help us meet our global, national, and landscape goals. Thank you for your time, and it's been a pleasure to be part of this journey. Thank you. Hi everyone, so um, I'm Jeanne, I'm the Head of Water Stewardship at Danone and very pleased to launch this uh, training review today. Um, we all start our water stewardship journey with very good intentions, um, but our good intentions means nothing uh, if it's not back up with a real plan. And the problem is the complexity of water stewardship, so complex to understand the concept, to know where to start, to scope your activities on the field, that for me to have a robust plan, we needed to start with education first. We often say that we need two revolutions to make water stewardship happen, one on education and one on finance. 
this training is going to tackle both of them. It's going to help us to have the right, the same, de the, the same definitions, scope this in the same way our activities, have the same ways of workings. And by this way, we will have the same references helping us to, say, to speak the same language and hopefully to have and to yeah, have larger actions and ambitions. That's, that's the first thing. The second thing is about finance. As I said, um, there is a big part of the course which is about understanding how to build the bankability of your project. Bankability means that you are not only doing your project for good, for people and planet, but you are as well thinking of the return of investment you can make through your project and for the people participating to your project. If we build better the bankability of our project, we will be able to attract better finance and to scale much further our project. That's very key. So those, this training is going to tackle, as I said, education, speaking the same language, being better equipped as water stewardship leader, and helping you to understand and design better the bankability of your project to hopefully unlock the investment you need to develop your project at scale. So um, as closing remarks, I think I have only one, one thing to say, it's just on role uh, for us to be as many as possible water stewardship leader, uh, being able to speak the same language and develop together the actions we need at the right scale. Thank you so much, Kate, and thank you very much for the water pavilion to hosting us and, help, and allowing us to, to launch this training today. Thank you, Jahan <clears throat> and team. Um, a really uh, powerful piece of the toolkit, really, that, we're, that we need in order to succeed in our, our journey towards a more water secure future. I'm really excited to be able to, to showcase the power of wetlands in another event in the coming week um, with our Climate Action Agenda event that's taking place on the 5th of November. Um, they really do play a vital, vital role in protecting the planet um, and it'll be great to bring that uh, more attention to this issue over the next few days. So. We have reached the final session of our marathon day of finance related activity and content on the Water Pavilion today. Um, I am going to be introducing uh, Veronica Guzman, who it works for uh, the Global Water Partnership in South America. We are, I believe, sorry, slight technical uh, double check and confirmation. Are we ready to go with that one, Jennifer? Okay, apologies. One more moment. We're so close to the end. <laughs> ah, okay. 